This is the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter, 2021. Lesson 2 for September 3 to 9, Covenant Primer, read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, April 3. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you as we open your word, and we're going to be looking this week, dear Lord, at so many instances where you had covenants with your people. We pray that as we do so, we may see the importance of the real covenant for us, the covenant that you gave your Son, that each of us could have eternal life. We pray that as we open your word, your Spirit will guide us, and you will bless us in our personal lives as well. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Let's read that again, Exodus 19 and verse 5. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Last week left off with the fall of humanity because of our first parents' sin. This week is a quick summary of the whole quarter as we take one day each to look at the early covenants, the ones that in their own way were all present truth manifestations of the true covenant, the one ratified at Calvary by the blood of Jesus, the one that we as Christians enter into with our Lord. We begin with the covenant God made with Noah to spare him and his family from destruction. We proceed to the covenant with Abraham, so rich and full of promise for all of us, then to the covenant at Sinai and the importance of what that proclaimed there, and finally we look at the new covenant, the one that all the others pointed toward. All of these, of course, will be studied in more depth over the next several weeks. This week is just a preview. And the week at a glance. What does the word covenant mean? What elements make up the covenant? What was the covenant that God made with Noah? What hope was found in the covenant with Abraham? What role do faith and works play in the human end of the covenant? Is the covenant just a deal? Or does it have relational aspects to it? What is the essence of the new covenant? Sunday, April 4. Covenant Basics. Genesis chapter 17 verse 2 reads, And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. From the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, volume 1, page 790, we read, the Hebrew word translated as covenant, appearing about 287 times in the Old Testament, is bereth. It can also be translated as testament or last will. Its origin is unclear, but it has come to mean that which bound two parties together. It was used, however, for many different types of bond, both between man and man and between man and God. It has a common use where both parties were men and a distinctively religious use where the covenant was between God and man. The religious use was really a metaphor based on the common use but with a deeper connotation or meaning. End of quote. Like the marriage covenant, the biblical covenant defines both a relationship and an arrangement. As an arrangement, the Biblical Covenant contains these basic elements. 1. God affirmed the covenant promises with an oath, as we read in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, 
who is Christ. And Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. And verse 17. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. And two, the covenant obligation was obedience to God's will as expressed in the Ten Commandments, as we read in Deuteronomy 4.13. So he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. And three, the means by which God's covenant obligation is ultimately fulfilled is through Christ and the plan of salvation, as we read in Isaiah 42, 1, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him, he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. And verse 6, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness, and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. So, look at the three elements listed above, God's promises, our obedience, and the plan of salvation. How can you see those factors at work in your own walk with the Lord? Write down a paragraph describing how they are manifest in your life now. In the Old Testament, the sacrificial system of types instructed the people regarding the entire plan of salvation. Through its symbols, the patriarchs and Israel learned to exercise faith in the coming Redeemer. Through its rites, the penitent could find forgiveness for sin and release from guilt. The blessings of the covenant could thus be retained and spiritual growth, restoring the image of God in the life, could thereby continue, even when humankind failed to uphold their end of the bargain. And so to finish today. Though there are covenants made between people, the main use of the word bereth in the Hebrew Bible deals with the relationship between God and humanity. Considering who God is, and who we are in comparison to Him, what kind of relationship would such a covenant depict? Monday, April 5. Covenant with Noah. Genesis chapter 6 verse 18 reads, But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. In the above verse, the word covenant appears for the first time in the Bible. And, in this context, God has just told Noah about his decision to destroy the earth because of the massive and continuing spread of sin. Though this destruction will come in a worldwide flood, God is not forsaking the world he created. He continues to offer the covenant relationship first set in operation after the fall. The divine I, who offers the covenant, is himself the ground of Noah's security. As the covenant-keeping God, the Lord promised to protect the family members who were willing to live in a committed relationship with Him, one that resulted in obedience. Question. Was the covenant with Noah just one-sided? Remember that the idea of a covenant implies more than one party. Did Noah have his end of the deal to uphold? What lesson is there for us in the answer to these questions. God tells Noah that there is going to be a flood and the world will be destroyed, but God makes a deal with him in which he promises to save Noah and his family. Thus the stakes were quite high because if God did not uphold his end of the promise, then no matter what Noah did, he would be wiped out with the rest of the world. God said he would make a covenant with Noah 
The word itself implies an intention to honour what one says one will do. It is not just some whimsical statement. The word itself comes loaded with commitment. Suppose the Lord had said to Noah, Look, the world is coming to an end in a terrible deluge, and I might save you, or I might not. In the meantime, do this, and this, and this, and then we'll see what happens. But I'm not making any guarantees. Such statements hardly come with the kind of assurance and promise found in the word covenant itself. And so to finish the day, some people have argued that Noah's flood was not worldwide, but merely a local deluge. If so, then in the context of what God promises in Genesis 9.15, and we'll also look at Isaiah 54 verse 9, every time another local flood happens, and they seem to happen all the time, God's covenant promise is broken. Let's have a look at Genesis 9.15, and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. And we'll compare that with Isaiah 54 and verse 9. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. In contrast, the fact that there has not been another worldwide flood proves the validity of God's covenant promise. In short, what does this tell us about how we can trust His promises? Tuesday, April 6. The Covenant with Abram. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3 reads, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Question. Read Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. List the specific promises God made to Abram. Genesis 12, beginning at verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Notice that among these promises God said to Abram that in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed, in verse 3. What does that mean? How were all the families of the earth blessed in Abram? Well, if we look at Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 to 9, just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. In what ways can you see in this earlier promise the promise of Jesus the Messiah? We look at Galatians 3 verse 26. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. In this, the first recorded divine revelation to Abram, God promised to enter into a close and lasting relationship with him, even before he used any language that spoke about covenant-making. Direct references to the covenant that God would make came later, in Genesis 15, 4-21, and Genesis 17, 1-14. Let's just have a look at those. Genesis 15, beginning at verse 4, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven, 
and count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him, and cut them in two down the middle, and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and, behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom yet they serve I will judge. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass, when the sun went down and it was dark, that, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, and the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. And then in Genesis 17, verses 1 to 14, we read, When Abram was ninety-nine years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male child in your generations. He who was born in your house, or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. He who is born in your house, and he who is bought with your money, must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child, who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. For the moment, God offered a divine human relationship of great significance. The repeated I will in Genesis 12, 1-3 suggests the depth and greatness of God's offer and promise. In addition, Abram received a single but testing command, Go forth. He obeyed by faith, as we read in Hebrews 11.8, but not in order to bring about the promised blessings. Hebrews 11 and verse 8. By faith Abraham, 
obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. His obedience was the response of his faith to the loving relationship which God already had established. In other words, Abram already believed in God, already trusted in God, already had faith in God's promises. He had to, otherwise he never would have left his family and ancestral land to begin with and headed into places unknown. His obedience revealed his faith both to men and to angels. Abram, even back then, revealed the key relationship between faith and works. We are saved by faith, a faith that results in works of obedience. The promise of salvation comes first, the works follow. Although there can be no covenant fellowship and no blessing without obedience, that obedience is faith's response to what God already has done. Such faith illustrates the principle in 1 John 4.19. We love Him, that's God, because He first loved us. And so to finish the day, Read Genesis 15 and verse 6. In what ways does it show the basis of all covenant promises? Why is this blessing the most precious one of all? Genesis 15 verse 6. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Wednesday, April 7. The Covenant with Moses. Question. Read Exodus chapter 6, verses 1 to 8, and then answer these questions. 1. What covenant was God talking about? Well, first of all, Exodus 6, 1 to 8. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will let them go, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, in which they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, I will rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then... You shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. And Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And question two, how was the Exodus to be a fulfilment on his part of the covenant promises? And question three, what parallel can you find between what God promised the people here and what he promised Noah before the flood? After the Exodus, the children of Israel received the covenant at Sinai given in the context of redemption from bondage as we read in Exodus chapter 20 verse 2 I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage and containing God's sacrificial provisions for atonement and the forgiveness of sin. 
It was therefore, like all of the covenants, a covenant of grace, God's grace extended to his people. In many ways, this covenant reiterated the major emphasis in the covenant with Abraham. One, it was a special relationship of God to his people, as you read in Genesis 17, verses 7 and 8. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Two, they would be a great nation. We're going to compare Genesis 12, verse 2 which reads, I will make you a great nation, I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing, with Exodus 19 and verse 6. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. And three, obedience was required. As we compare Genesis 17, 9 to 14, and God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout your generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations, he who is born in your house, or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant, he who is born in your house, and he who is bought with your money, must be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child, who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And we compare that with Genesis twenty two sixteen to 18. By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. And we also compare that with Genesis 19, verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Note the order here. We read in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 602, The Lord first saves Israel then gives them his law to keep. The same order is true under the gospel. Christ first saves us from sin, as you read in John 1.29 and 1 Corinthians 15.3 and Galatians 1.4, then lives out his law within us, as you read in Galatians 2.20, Romans 4.25 and Romans 8.1-3 and 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. End of quote. Let's read those texts. First of all, John 1, nine. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And Galatians 1 verse 4, Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. 
and Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And Romans 4, verse 25, Who was delivered up because of our offences, and was raised because of our justification. And Romans 8, 1 to 3, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. And First Peter 2 and verse 24, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. And so, to finish today, read Exodus chapter 6 and verse 7. I will make you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. What is the one thing that comes through in the first part, where the Lord says they will be his people and he their God? Notice the dynamics here. They will be something to God, and God will be something to them. Not only does God want to relate to them in a special way, He also wants them to relate to Him in a special way as well. Does the Lord not seek the same kind of relationship with us today? Does that first part of Exodus 6-7 reflect your relationship with the Lord, or are you just someone whose name is on the church books? If your answer to the first part of the question is yes, give reasons why. Let's read Exodus 6 verse 7 again. I will take you as my people. I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Thursday, April 8, the New Covenant. Our text for today is Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 33. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. These passages are the first time the Old Testament mentions what is referred to as the New Covenant. It is lodged in the context of Israel's return from exile, and it talks about the blessings they will receive from God. Again, as in all the other instances, it is God who initiates the covenant, and it is God who will fulfil it by His grace. Notice also the language there. God referred to Himself as a husband to them. He talked about writing His law within their hearts and using language from the Abrahamic covenant. He says He will be their God, and they will be His people. Thus, as before, the covenant is not just some legal binding agreement as in courts of law today. It deals with something else. Question. Read Jeremiah 31 verse 33 and compare it with Exodus 6 verse 7, which details part of the covenant made with Israel. Again, what's the key element that comes through here? What does God want from his people? Jeremiah 31, verse 33, But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. 
I will put my law in their minds, and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And we're comparing that with Exodus chapter 6 and verse 7. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Question. Read Jeremiah 31, verse 34. Compare what is being said there to John chapter 17, verse 3. What is the key thing that the Lord does that builds the foundation for this relationship? Jeremiah 31 and verse 34. No more shall every man teach his neighbour and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. And John 17, verse 3. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. In Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, one can see the elements of both grace and obedience, just as in the earlier covenants. God will forgive their sins, God will enter into a relationship with them, and God will bestow His grace in their lives. As a result, the people simply obey Him, not in some rote mechanical way, but purely because they know Him, because they love Him, and because they want to serve Him. This captures the essence of the covenant relationship the Lord seeks with His people. And so to finish today, how do you understand this idea of the law as being written in our hearts? Does it imply that the law becomes subjective and personal, something to be interpreted and applied according to the individual configurations of our hearts? Or does it mean something else? If so, what? Friday, April 9. From the book The Desire of Ages, page 329 and 330, we read, The yoke that binds to service is the law of God. The great law of love revealed in Eden, proclaimed upon Sinai, and in the new covenant written in the heart, is that which binds the human worker to the will of God. If we were left to follow our own inclinations, to go just where our will would lead us, we would fall into Satan's ranks and become possessors of his attributes. Therefore, God confines us to his will, which is high and noble and elevating. He desires that we shall patiently and wisely take up the duties of service. The yoke of service Christ himself has borne in humanity. He said in Psalm 40 verse 8, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. And in John 6.38, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Love for God, zeal for his glory, and love for fallen humanity brought Jesus to earth to suffer and to die. This was the controlling power of his life, the principle he bids us adopt. End of quote. And that brings us to our three questions, our three discussion questions for this week. One, was God's covenant with Noah, Abram, Moses and us a continuation of his covenant with Adam? Or was it something new? Let's look at Genesis 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And Genesis 22, 18. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. And Galatians 3, verse 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, 
preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. And verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, And to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. Question 2. Why is the personal relational aspect of the covenant so important? In other words, you can have a legally binding deal, a covenant with someone, without any close personal interaction. That kind of arrangement is not, however, what the Lord is seeking in His covenant relationship with His people. Why is that so? Discuss this. 3. In what ways is marriage a good analogy for the covenant? In what ways does the analogy of marriage fall short in describing the covenant? And to summarise this week's lesson. The entrance of sin ruptured the relationship the Creator had originally established with the human family through our first parents. Now God seeks to re-establish that same loving relationship by means of a covenant. This covenant signifies both a committed relationship between God and us, like a marriage bond, and an arrangement for saving us and bringing us into harmony with its Maker. God Himself, motivated by His great love for us, is the initiator of the covenant relationship. By gracious promises and gracious acts, He woos us to come into union with Him. Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Farmer Plants Churches and it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. A Seventh day Adventist minister asked Huang Wen Ming, a farmer with no theological training, to help plant a church in a small village located a two and a half hour drive from his home in southern Taiwan. Wen Ming was surprised. He wasn't a church member but he worshipped every Sabbath in his own village. He agreed to help. He spoke with a church member who had a female relative in the other village, Ba'eo, where no Adventist lived. She gave permission to start a house church in her home. Wen Ming and the pastor took turns preaching in the house church every Sabbath, and six people were baptised in six months. About a half year after that, Wen Ming himself was baptised. Adventist leaders were impressed that God had blessed Wen Ming's efforts in southern Taiwan, a region where the church has struggled to make inroads. The Taiwan Conference asked him to plant a church in another southern village, Santi. Six years later, that church was prospering and Wen Ming was asked to reopen a church in Saitea. For the first time, Wen Ming was worried. He thought about his lack of theological training and prayed. Two people showed up on the first Sabbath that Wen Ming reopened the church's doors. He encouraged the two worshippers to open their own homes to neighbours for Friday evening programs and to invite them to attend church services the next day. After eight years, the church had 74 members. After 17 years of planting churches, Wen Ming said the secret is to follow Christ's method alone, which Ellen White described this way. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Saviour mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. And that's from the Ministry of Healing, page 143. Wen Ming, 75 years old, said he tries to meet people's needs. At Sataya, he brought mangoes, watermelons and guavas from his farm for a fellowship meal every Sabbath. After three years, worshippers began to follow his example. The young pastor who replaced Wen Ming as leader of Sataya asked with astonishment, How did you grow this church? How can I grow a church like you did? Show mercy, be patient, be humble and love others, Wen Ming said. 
just be like Jesus. And there's a photograph of Wen Ming here on his motorbike. Part of the 2018-13 Sabbath offering helped open six health-focused urban centres of influence in Adventist churches in Taiwan. Thank you for your mission offerings that help spread the gospel. And I've actually visited a church uh, in Taiwan. And if anyone from Taiwan is listening, please contact me. I'd love to know uh, that you're listening to this podcast from your country. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.